Welcome to Mind Love, episode 43. Today's episode is all about recovery, labeling ourselves, and sharing our stories. By embracing the label, by telling your story, you are getting all those people that are struggling in shame. Me, when I was home alone in my cocaine-addled brain in my apartment, all of those people get to hear about it and go, whoa, maybe there's hope for me too. Turn up your frequency with Mind Love. Bite-sized brain hacks for seekers, dreamers, and doers. It's time to give your mind a little love with your host, Melissa Monti. First off, Mind Love is now a CastBox original. CastBox is the fastest growing, highest rated podcast app on both iOS and Android, where you can get all of your favorite podcasts. It has a super clean layout and you can create playlists and download episodes to play offline. It's my personal favorite and where I listen to all of my podcasts. Don't worry, you can still listen to Mind Love wherever you get your podcasts, but I hope you'll give CastBox a try. Second, don't forget to subscribe on whatever podcast platform you're listening on and leave a review if you can. Reviews really help to entice more amazing guests. Plus, it helps me grow the show, which ultimately helps me give more value to you guys. Before I started Mind Love, I could not have predicted the amount of healing I would find through sharing my story. You know how when you have an idea for a project or a business or whatever it is, and you think it's this complete picture until you write it down and suddenly realize there are all these holes? Well, it's almost like that. But in telling my story, suddenly a chord would be hit and I'd realize there's more work to be done there. Or some other memory would be unlocked and I'd understand the root or the after effects just a little bit deeper. So on one hand, people might say, well, that seems painful. Why would you want to dig that up? But on the other, it frees up space. If you move houses, leaving those last three boxes of knickknacks packed in the garage would be easier. But then where will you build your lady cave? Or start unpacking and after a little extra effort, you'll have a place for everything, you'll discover some things or metaphorical parts of yourself you forgot about, and you'll have all this space to start designing the garage of your dreams or the life of your dreams. I don't even know if that was that good of a metaphor, but (laughs) you get the picture. Our guest today specializes in helping you unpack your shit to get it on paper. I met her at this really cool gathering of successful entrepreneurs. She was asked to share her story, and the moment I heard it, I knew I wanted her on the show. She's definitely gone through her share of really low lows, which I can relate to, but she's managed to find creative outlets of self-expression to pull herself out of that, whether it's writing, speaking, or podcasting, and now she helps other people access their dark so they can find their light through writing, storytelling, podcasting, or whatever means of self-expression you find most appealing. So today, three key things you will learn are tips to living with addiction triggers, how embracing labels could actually be empowering, and how to detox your social circle. Before we get started, I want to tell you about the best way to stay in your highest frequency between episodes. Thousands of listeners are loving my daily morning mind love emails. They're short daily reminders of your own beauty, magic, and power so you can start each day with your best mindset. Just go to mindlove.com and sign up right there on the homepage. Plus, you'll get some amazing free gifts when you do. First, you'll get a really cool free booklet of Powerless based on proven methods from the most successful people in the world to automate your highest decisions. Plus, you'll get a free guided affirmation meditation. It's set with a binaural frequency known as the Miracle Tone, which is known to make you a magnet for love, health, and abundance. Then it's layered with affirmations to perfectly tune your frequency for transformation. Just go to mindlove.com to sign up. Or if you're out and about, just text the word morning to 444-999. That's morning to 444-999. Also, the highly anticipated FabFitFun Fall Box is finally here. With FabFitFun for just $49.99 each season, you get a box filled with 8 to 10 full-sized premium beauty, fashion, fitness, and wellness products valued at over $200. And I have to say, the Fall Box is pretty epic. There's a gorgeous Vince Camuto tote bag in here worth $128. That's way more than the cost of the box. I'm also loving this adorable little ceramic tea kettle, a designer umbrella, and even Cobra wireless earbuds. There is so much value in this box. Sign up for FabFitFun today to get your fall box. The FabFitFun fall box is in limited supply, and these boxes always sell out. 
Use my code MINDLOVE to get $10 off your first box at fabfitfun.com. Use promo code MINDLOVE to get $10 off your first box. That's over $200 for only $39.99. Go to fabfitfun.com and use my code MINDLOVE to get $10 off your first FabFitFun box. And now let's welcome Anna David to the show. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. I know your life up until now has been a bit of a roller coaster. So let's start with your story. How did you get to where you are now? Okay. How do I summarize it quickly? Basically, I was a wild and crazy party girl that nobody thought would amount to anything. Turned out I was an addict. I had no idea. I thought I was super fun and cool. And then I went to rehab and got sober in 2000. So I've been sober almost 18 years. And lo and behold, underneath that party girl, cocaine addicted persona was like Reese Witherspoon in election, you know, with like the pencils sharpened and like the most ambitious. I'm just nothing like I thought I was. I thought I was really cool and not very motivated. It turns out I'm not that cool. I'm incredibly motivated. I'm not like a callous bitch. I'm actually really sensitive. And so this whole journey has been me coming to understand who I really am. And And coming to understand a brain that told me that like doing cocaine every day was a great idea. Yeah, for sure. I can totally relate to the party girl thing. I went to a huge party school in college and had a really big Greek system. So, of course, I joined a sorority. And my nickname in one of the top party schools in the country was actually just party girl. Classy, I know. (laughs) And then I spent over a decade in my party days. And while I was in it, I used to think, man, other people's lives are so boring. And I'd seek out older people that were still partying to kind of validate my life choices that I was going to be cool forever. I'm not a regular mom. I'm a cool mom. (laughs) But now I see my friends that are still kind of in it and I don't really envy it at all. Okay, so I usually don't cut in this early, but it's funny how sometimes when I seem to declare something, the universe will totally throw me a curveball between the taping and posting of an episode. So Labor Day happened last week, and my hubby and I were having a responsible, healthy little holiday. We were riding bikes home from the beach, and suddenly I felt the need to rage. I call my party days my rage days, FYI. I wanted one of those bottomless rosé on a patio type days, and I wanted it so bad I felt like crying. Well, being as aware as I am now, I started to try to figure out what the root was. Where was this coming from? Long story short, I suddenly realized it's September now, which is the anniversary of my dad's death. And historically, this has been a really difficult month for me. The moment I made that connection, I felt in my stomach that that's where this was coming from. I wasn't missing my rage days as much as I was suddenly really compelled to numb. Well, first of all, as much as I now know and teach about trauma living in the body, it's still crazy to me when it pops up and reminds me so blatantly before the conscious awareness even set in. And second, I was reminded to show gratitude for my own growth in being able to identify these little things instead of just being controlled by them. And then third having compassion for myself for choosing an extra glass of wine that night anyways. It's about progress, not perfection, right? But partying, especially if substances are involved, is a huge mind warp. I know. Well, and I know you too had eating stuff, which is such a similar path. It really is. You know, I truly believe that the disease, if you want to call it a disease, manifests itself in all sorts. It finds what your thing is going to be because it's about controlling how you feel and it's about avoiding how you feel all of it. So yeah. And you know, my first book is called Party Girl, by the way. And yeah, it's so funny because I remember I studied in in England, my junior year in college, and I remember going to dinner with a bunch of people before I danced and they weren't ordering drinks. And I was just astounded. I couldn't understand how I had ended up with such uncool people. I couldn't understand how they were living on this earth, the same earth I was living on. And now, obviously, I mean, plus you get older, your perspective on partying changes a lot. Yeah, I mean, for most of us, that's for sure. (laughs) When was that moment that you realized... This isn't what fun is supposed to be. Maybe I need to take a step back, look at it, and make some changes. Well, terrifyingly, that moment happened maybe a decade before I actually made the changes. I remember thinking, 
in college that I might have a drinking problem. And then it progressed so badly when I was in my 20s. It's hard to do cocaine by yourself and not know you have a problem. You know you have a problem when you're at that point. So it's sort of about how your brain is going to handle that. Is your brain going to go, I have a problem and it's okay. I have a problem and let's try to do something about it. I have a problem and I've tried to do something about it and can't. And I went to all of those places. So I think the first time I tried, God, just to control and enjoy my cocaine use was probably three years before I went to rehab. So what did that look like when you were trying to control cocaine use? Because those who do coke are probably like, oh, yeah, I'm a functional cocaine user. But for those who don't do cocaine, I'm guessing it sounds kind of crazy. For those who don't do cocaine, I don't believe there's any way to do hard drugs, casually hard drugs, meaning like cocaine or heroin or something like that. You know, when I started off doing it, I could control it. I could sort of do it and put it away. The problem with cocaine is that it has a very short half-life. So it wears off quickly. And if you are addicted the way I was, you just have to keep doing it until it's done. And it was so dark. I cannot even explain how dark my life got because it was like I had this thing. I knew I couldn't live without it. I've never known something as much as I knew I could not live without cocaine. And yet I knew I couldn't live with it. So what that looked like was I would buy it. I would throw it away. Then I would dig it out of the garbage. Then I was like, okay, that won't work. I'm going to buy it. I'm going to throw it in the dumpster. Then I would go and dig it out of the dumpster. Then I would say, well, that doesn't work. I'm going to flush it. So then I would flush it. And then I would call my dealer again. And when you're at that point, you're just beyond despair. And I got to the point that I think pretty much everybody I know who's sober got to, which was, I'm going to have to kill myself because I can't quit. I can't live without it. I don't know what to do. And I'm really grateful I got to that point because when I got to that point, I was willing to go to rehab and do anything people told me to do, even if it meant giving up the thing I cared more about than anything in the world. And of course, it was nothing like I expected it to be. I thought life was over. I thought I will never have fun again. I tried to conceive of a life without it. And I thought like, well, maybe do you just go to plays a lot? I really had no concept of how you could go to dinner or a party or anywhere without drinking. And I found very quickly that my perception had been totally off and that life was kind of just beginning and not ending. Oh my God, just the thought of that cycle makes my face scrunch up because you're right. It's so much like an eating disorder. Sometimes I would plan my binging and purging cycles, knowing I was going to have the house to myself or something. But the times that were the most defeating were those unexpected times that would start with healthy choices and then I'd be triggered by something or I'd be alone and I couldn't make any concrete plans with people. Next thing I knew, I'd be at a grocery store and I was in college, so I'd have like $27 in my bank account and then I'd spend $26 on shit food and binge and purge until I'd finish it. And sometimes halfway through, I'd say to myself, just throw the rest away and I would, rarely, but then I'd end up eating my roommate's leftovers and act like it wasn't me. It was awful. It wasn't me. I didn't feel like myself. I don't like those memories. Those memories feel like dumpster memories, just a deep pit of despair. For me, I couldn't call it something that I loved. Well, maybe there were parts of it I thought I loved, but it was more like an abusive relationship. Here's my thing about addiction. I've never had an eating disorder and everyone in my family has had them and everyone I know has had them. So I may be speaking out of turn, but I see it all like this. That basically the brains of people who have these disorders are sort of manufacture a hundred forms of fear. And it's such a scary way to live. With alcoholism and addiction, it's like they have these things like I'm not much, but I'm all I think about or I'm the piece of crap in the center of the universe. And so if you have a brain that thinks like that, it is a very painful way to live. And you need something to put it at ease. And so you, that case me, discovers drinking and then that puts it at ease and oh my god it's amazing like all those thoughts are gone or they're alleviated or whatever and then what happens is you keep that sets off the phenomenon of craving it keeps going it keeps progressing you know you have to do more and more and more and then you hate it and it, everything that it did for you in the beginning it turns on you like the worst enemy you've ever had 
And all those thoughts you had that brought you subconsciously to pick up this behavior in the first place are exacerbated. And they're like on a megaphone inside your ear. And you don't know what to do because this you've known for 10 or 15 years was your savior. So that's the funny thing about it is I convinced myself I was having fun, even though I was sitting in my apartment alone doing cocaine for 10 hours, jittery and thinking my neighbors were spying on me. Like that's not fun by anybody's stretch of the imagination. But that's just how the brain does it. So I hated it, too. But I still did it all the time. No matter what the addiction is, whether it's drugs or food or sex or even emotional addictions like anger, I think it comes back to the same thing. The more you give in to the urges, the more you strengthen those neural loops and they're even harder to break. It's like trotting the same path so often you can't see any other way through the woods. And those of us with addictive tendencies train our brain to give in to these urges. We're basically conditioning ourselves to seek these numbing behaviors, which is why I think in AA, if you have a problem with alcohol, they have you give up all substances. It makes a lot of sense. I gave up alcohol for 30 days a while back and noticed that during that time, I totally upped my intake of vegan chocolate, (laughs) which I'm actually thankful for because it went from an eating disorder to Adderall to hard drugs occasionally to alcohol to vegan chocolate. (laughs) Not so bad, but I can still do better. Have your addictive tendencies spilled into other areas of your life? Yeah. So I got sober. I went to rehab and then I do 12 step and like 12 step is my saving grace. I love it. It's not for everyone. Now I'm almost 18 years sober, so I don't do it as much as I did before. This is how I look at it. I got all that stuff kind of freaked me out. It's why I didn't want to go to 12 step. And then I went to 12 step. Like I said, I was willing to do whatever they suggested I should do. And I was told to try to connect with this being larger than myself. And I was so desperate. I was willing to do something that sounded as creepy as that sounded. And very quickly upon doing that, my desire to drink and do drugs went away. And I didn't have some white, shiny light, God reaching a hand down from the heavens. But this makes no logical sense that this thing that I had been trying to stop doing for five years and could never stop would just go away unless it was some spiritual experience that I can't articulate or understand. So I believe that if you do not replace your addiction with something else, then you're destined to repeat it in all aspects of your life. So in a perfect world, in the ideal scenario, I replaced it with a higher power. Of course, it's not that simple. And I do have addictive tendencies that spill out. But if I'm sort of on the spiritual beam, I don't as much. I am a total workaholic. I absolutely love it. I am not bottomed out on it. And I kind of get this from you too. Like when you find something you love, there's no shame in wanting to do it a lot. I have had very much, you know, when I said I'm eating disorder adjacent, I've definitely had exercise addict tendencies. It's interesting. I'm totally giving the longest answer ever, but I've started doing EMDR. How much do you know about EMDR? For those of you who don't know about EMDR, it stands for Eye Movement Desensitization and Reprocessing, and it's used to treat trauma. During EMDR therapy sessions, you relive traumatic or triggering experiences in short spurts while the therapist directs your eye movement. So the therapist will make you walk through it detail by detail while having you follow a light with your eyes, or sometimes even with sound, like a beep alternating from your right ear to your left ear over and over again. I have mixed feelings about treatments that ask you to relive traumatic events, but this one makes sense to me. The reason that EMDR is supposed to work is because recalling distressing events is usually less emotionally upsetting when your attention is diverted, hence the directing your eye movements part. So for example, instead of thinking about my dad's death every September and totally losing my shit, over time through EMDR, I would get used to talking about this and not feel so triggered by it. I did EMDR in high school after I was raped. I hadn't thought about it in a while, though, until recently, for whatever reason, it keeps being mentioned by different people, which is normally my sign that it's something I need to act on. Yeah, I had known I needed to do it for a long time. I, too, had tried it a long time ago, and it didn't really do much. So now I've been doing it really intensely for like two months, twice a week. And it is so bizarre because my exercise and work obsessions have just diminished 
because I think all of that escapist tendency stuff is about trying to run from ourselves and our trauma and whatever happened to us before we were 18 or whatever it is. My most alcoholic characteristic is that I'm a real extremist. I think people are the best or the worst. There's very little gray area. This is one of the main things I work on is seeing the gray. Like, because if you meet somebody, whether it's a friend, a boyfriend, a therapist, a boss, and you convince yourself this is the best person on earth, you get to get high off of that. The problem is you're totally setting yourself up for disappointment when the And that's actually something that I've been working on in EMDR because I finally realized this comes from the fact that I come from a family that would give love and then take it away. They'd just be like, you're amazing. And then the next time it would be like, you're a total monster. And so I started to do that all over the world with everybody else to do to them what was done to me. I tend to do the same thing, but I think it's natural as humans to go to that place of judgment. But these things are a huge reflection of how I am with myself as well. It's a catch-22 because the more I work on myself, the more aware I am of how toxic judgment can be. But also I'm learning all these things about how I want to start my mornings and stop eating when I'm full and project kindness and generosity and all these perfect ways to be. But we're humans and we're not perfect. And I can't always make the changes as quickly as I learn them. <laughs> but then I have to remind myself not to beat myself up when I make a mistake. But then to make things even more complicated, it's even easier to see flaws in other people than it is to see in myself. So it's obviously pretty easy to see those things friends should work on. And then it becomes this balance between judgment and intuition. Are some of these people pulling me towards my lower frequencies so I need to protect my energy? Or am I just being judgmental? It's so hard. And this is also part of the quote unquote disease is for me, my whole life, I'll kind of go like, look at my friends. Oh my God. And I can build a case why someone's terrible. I mean, I'm a professional storyteller. I am such a good storyteller. I can convince me. I can convince you. I can convince anyone who's going to listen to me. And I'm so convincing that they'll go, oh my God, you're right. That person is terrible. I was a huge cut and runner. I just wake up one day and decide I didn't like you and just ghost way before anybody else was using that term. And I didn't even know I was like that until about 10 years of sobriety. And I'd look back and go, God, I really miss that person. Why did I decide she was psychotic? Oh, God. And so now I know with my brain that I don't think my brain works correctly without spiritual intervention or without me stopping and pausing. So when I start to decide I hate someone who's one of the closest people in my life, I now know, put a pin in it. Let's think about this tomorrow. You don't need to ruin the relationship and scorch the earth right now. Like, let's just reassess later. And I've learned that I just can't trust my brain. I just can't. I do find it interesting that you'll just identify with certain things and say, my brain doesn't work that way, or I am an addict, even after being sober for so many years. And a lot of people argue that being so quick to label yourself keeps you from expanding to what you could be. But I know that you have a different take on labels. Very much. And it's really, really controversial. So yeah, I give three TEDx talks this year, and it's about why I think labels are really good, and particularly the label of addict, which this has gotten very controversial. And I have good friends who are going around trying to start these movements that say the word addict is pejorative. We should not use it. And in fact, the Associated Press released a statement last year saying that journalists shouldn't even use the word addict in articles. They should instead say person who struggles with addiction. And it's a big thing in 12 step, which is that you say your first name and then you identify with the word alcoholic or addict or whatever it is. I firmly believe my brain does not work the way a non-addict's brain works. I believe I am more self-absorbed, more self-hating, more scared, and that it's okay. It's not my fault. I am an addict and I have great tools. And with those tools, I get to function, I don't even want to say like better than the average person, but I get to go in with full awareness and to say things like, oh, you can't trust your brain right now. So I think it's a wonderful word to embrace because it doesn't really make sense to me otherwise. It's like, okay, so no, I'm a totally normal person who just thought it was completely normal to do cocaine every day for three years by myself. Not really. Like there's something going on with that brain. And I think it's by calling the word addict negative that 
it's the problem. I mean, the truth is like, I'm super proud of it now. I got sober and I realized, oh my God, addicts are without a doubt the smartest people I've ever met. This is a dumb example, but whenever I play words with friends with somebody from program, I lose. Whenever I play words with friends with somebody who's not from program, I win. Addicts are freaking crafty. Like we have to be in order to get away with what we got got away with. And if you can use that craftiness and that intelligence and that charm, I mean, it's the most charming, funny group of people I've ever met. You can do anything you want, anything. I think it's a great word. So yeah, that is considered controversial. I can see how it's controversial because to be honest, I'm on the other side of this belief. Well, two weeks ago, if you would have asked me, I would have been on the complete other side, but I have a story. First of all, I grew up going to NA and AA meetings. My dad used to go to them and he even led those meetings. And I'd be the kid playing with blocks in the corner while people stood up and told their sometimes way too detailed (laughs) stories and testimonies. Well, with everything I've learned in the last decade about how the brain works, there's a huge part of me that thinks it cannot be beneficial to declare that about yourself sometimes every single day. I'm very careful now about what I allow to follow the words I am. If you say I am followed by anything, it should be really positive. So with this in mind, you and I knew this interview was going to happen for the last month, so I kind of wondered in the back of my mind how I was going to handle this topic. But just the other day, something interesting happened, and I immediately got clarity on this labeling issue I have and then thought of you. So the last few years have been a lot of self-discovery with my body. You know, now that I'm keeping food down and not taking copious amounts of Adderall daily and all that good stuff. Well, recently, it's become really clear to me that I'm actually an introvert, which, like I said, I was a party girl. I didn't think that you could be a party girl and an introvert. But I really need my alone time to recharge. And certain social situations, especially networking, just feels draining. And there's a list of other things that come with being introverted. Well, I was telling my friend Brett about this discovery, and she said, well, by attaching to that label, don't you think it holds you back? And I said, no, because now I understand why I am that way, and now I can figure out the tools to help me without trying to become someone that I'm not. And the moment I said that, I thought of this upcoming interview, and I was like, well, I understand. But on the flip side, I still have a problem with people saying, I'm going to have an eating disorder for the rest of my life. And I may have those tendencies, but that's not a label that I want to attach myself to. So I do think that these labels are really subjective. And you have to ask yourself personally, am I willing to identify with this? How does this make me feel? Does this one make you feel empowered with knowledge that now you can find tools to work within your comfort zone? Or does it make you feel disempowered? Like, oh my God, I have to live with this forever? I don't want a life like that. So you have to find what's right for you. I think that's absolutely true. And I also think it depends on the person. I believe absolutely there are people who were addicted who are not addicts. There are people who have eating disorders who are not going to have eating disorders or struggle with food for the rest of their lives. We're all different. For me, I believe, I don't even think I was born. I mean, that's like another controversy is like, were you born an addict? I think addiction or alcoholism, like we have a genetic predisposition and then it's either exacerbated or diminished depending on what happens to us during our formative years. And I believe my conditions exacerbated that genetic predisposition. My brother's not an alcoholic. My mother's not an alcoholic, but it is in my family and I got it as a result of what happened to me. I believe it can be a phase, but it's the dangerous part is how. How do you know which one you are? I just ran into someone yesterday who I knew when I got sober and it's always weird because it's been so long and you don't want to make anyone feel bad. He's like, yeah, yeah, I know you from the cabin, which is this place we all, this meeting we all went to. And I say, oh, you still doing the deal? And he's like, yeah, three months back I had 10 years and then I went out and it turns out they were right. It was the same old thing. But there are people who are sober a long time who go out and can totally drink normally. So it's not only about does this label make you feel limited or free, but which are you? And that's really in a way up for you to decide along if you can take an honest look at your behavior, which can be hard for a lot of us. Speaking of taking a look at our behavior, how subjective would you say addiction is? I feel like there are a lot of people I see that I could easily classify as an alcoholic, but they don't see it in themselves. 
And then there are other people I know who gave up drinking in the last few years and have expressed that they had a problem. And I think, really, I didn't see that. So what do you think makes an addict? It's such a good question. And the way I think about it is, I think, different than a lot of people. I do not think it's about how much you drink. I don't think it's about how drunk you get. I don't think it's about if you've had a DUI or shot heroin. I think it is about, does it make your life unmanageable? If one of the signs, and this is weird, is do you beat yourself up for it? Two people can go out and get absolutely wasted and make a total fool of themselves. And one person wakes up and it was like, that was the best time I've ever had. And the other person wakes up and doesn't get out of bed because they just feel so terrible about it. The shame is definitely a part of it. and does it make your life unmanageable. Are you not doing what it is you are saying you're going to do? And some people, I believe they're not alcoholics who could totally drink every day. And there are alcoholics who could only drink once a month, but when they drink, that makes their life unmanageable. So that's, I think, the really confusing part. There are questionnaires. John Hopkins has a questionnaire. I can't remember. I think it's 20 questions. And if you answer seven or more, you might have a problem. I think if anybody's wondering, go to a meeting, go to an AA meeting, understand you will hate it. You will hate it so much. God, did I hate my first ones? We all did. And understand that I think a lot of people who are out there struggling, they might go to a meeting and they'll go, oh, these freaking people. And they think we all went skipping hand in hand into these meetings because we were so excited to be these annoying do-gooders. And it's like, no, 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 no. We all felt that way. So what's recommended is go to six. So you go, you hate it. Guaranteed, you'll hate everybody. You will take their inventory, that judgmental mind we were talking about. And so go to another one. And if after six completely different ones, you hate everybody, you have heard nothing you relate to, then you've done the deal. You've given it a try. When we come back, we'll learn the signs of addiction and how and when to detox your friendship circle. So many mind love guests have stressed mindful eating as such an important part of self-care. We have more energy, we get sick less, and we even deepen our intuition when we eat nourishing, healthy meals. But honestly, eating right can be really hard to maintain. Sunbasket makes it easy and convenient to give your body healthy, delicious meals at home. They have options for every lifestyle, including vegan, vegetarian, pescatarian, gluten-free, and paleo. Just go to the Sunbasket app and pick from 18 weekly recipes, all to be delivered right to your door. Last night, I cooked these amazing portobello burgers with vegan Caesar dressing and tomato almond salad. It was mouthwatering. Plus, you can feel really good about where your food came from because Sunbasket works with the best farms and suppliers to bring you fresh organic produce and clean ingredients. And it's all pre-measured and easy to prep for healthy, delicious meals in about 30 minutes. Perfect for busy lifestyles. Go to sunbasket.com slash mindlove today to learn more and get $35 off your first order. That's sunbasket.com slash mindlove for $35 off. sunbasket.com slash mindlove. Not to brag, but I look so cute right now. And I have Stitch Fix to thank. Stitch Fix is an online personal styling service that finds and delivers clothes, shoes, and accessories to fit your body, budget, and lifestyle. I just got my fix a few days ago and they totally nailed it, especially with this Moda Luxe crossbody bag. Just what I needed. And it looks perfect with this neutral knit blazer they sent. They even gave me ideas on outfits to pair each item. Just tell them your sizes, what styles you like, and how much you want to spend on each item. You'll be paired with your very own personal stylist who will hand pick five items to send right to your door. Then you try them on, pay only for what you love, and return the rest. Shipping exchanges and returns are always free, and there's no subscription required. You can either sign up to receive scheduled shipments or get your fix whenever you want. Stitch Fix's styling fee is only $20, which is applied towards anything you keep from your shipment. Get started now at stitchfix.com slash mindlove, and you'll get 25% off when you keep all five items in your box. That's stitchfix.com slash mindlove to get started today. Stitchfix.com slash mindlove. Some people, including my dad, went to AA meetings until he died. And then I think it was episode 11, another really great episode on addiction, listeners, Lisa Carpenter said her husband went to meetings for a few years and then didn't really need them anymore. So for you, after being sober for so long, what keeps you going back? A great question and different for everybody. And let me just answer it by saying, when I was new, I went all the time. I was really into it. And then when I was got to be about 10 years sober, I started going maybe 
once a week for a while. About six months ago, I realized I was like living with this chronic level of dissatisfaction. I had everything I wanted, everything in my life, and I was still feeling dissatisfied. And so I decided to do this thing people talk about, which is do a 90 and 90, go every day for three months. And I just wanted to see what would happen. And my attitude about everything changed. That chronic level of dissatisfaction went away. Then shit got really, really hard for me. I endured a horrible summer, which is why I decided to do the EMDR, exacerbated the horror, but it was also necessary. And thank God I had that foundation. And and what you get, I think people think you go and you talk about like, I really want to drink. I sure, of course, people say that. I go and people that I know in long-term sobriety go because we believe our brains don't function normally. And we become victims of alcoholics don't own the patent on this. This is the human condition. But I believe alcoholism is sort of like humanism to an exponential degree. It's the same self-hating, self-absorbed thoughts that all human beings have, but our volume is turned up really, really, really high, especially with compare and despair. You know, that's a really easy thing we all do where we go around and we go, we compare our insides to someone else's outsides, especially in this Instagram culture where people are perpetuating that this idea that they have perfect lives. And you go to a meeting and you are going to hear people talk about the real stuff and you're going to go, wow, I have it so good. You are going to get out of your self-absorption. And that's the other thing is alcoholics are so self-obsessed. And you're going to be reminded that there's a spiritual solution. You're going to be reminded of things that have turned out to be true over and over and over again. You know, when I was in the depths of it this summer, I went to a meeting where I heard a guy talk. He'd been the speaker six months before. He'd said the same thing, but I hadn't grabbed onto it. And he said, go around and live your life trying to make other people's dreams come true. And things will turn out even better than you can possibly imagine. And I just clung to that and it's become true. You go so you can hear the ideas. Uh, they say alcoholics have a built-in forgetter. You know, we know these things. And then every day you kind of need another reminder. So I would go and I would be reminded of all these spiritual principles that put my brain at ease and that I forget unless I'm reminded. What happened after 90 days is I got so freaking sick of the meetings that I'm now back to one a week. And that feels like plenty, but I'm so grateful it's there for this tune up because my friends who are not in program, if when they feel chronically dissatisfied, they don't have somewhere they can go every day for three months and have it go away. Yeah, I think it comes back to having this level of self awareness and being okay with that. Sometimes more helps, sometimes it doesn't. Really, with anything in life, though. It's so important to just stop and do an overall scan of your life and your actions, your reactions, your habits, your moods, your friends, and decide, is this still serving me? Are there downsides? Where can I improve? Just bringing that awareness and mindfulness into anything that you make a big part of your life is good practice. We all know the hardest thing is self-assessment. And right now I have two therapists and my main therapist was saying, you know, I was like, yeah, I'm not going to do this everyday meeting thing when I was about halfway through. And she goes, you have been a remarkably different person since you started doing this. I highly suggest you keep doing it. I wouldn't have if she hadn't said that. So it is really important to get other people's perspective. Right. And it's also so important to surround yourself with people that you want to be like, the people that push you. I've been really deliberate with this the last few years, mostly because I've grown so much. There were friendships I've had for a long time, about a decade, that I let go because they just didn't fit my lifestyle anymore. And we say, let go of that which is not serving you. And it sounds kind of selfish, like a friendship is supposed to serve you, but it's more like, is this lifting me up or dragging me down? And then, of course, people might do the same thing to you, depending on what their values are at the moment. I definitely was ghosted by some of my party friends because they don't know how to have a friendship beyond that with me right now. It's this rebirth of finding new people, making new friends at the age of 30-something. Everything's cyclical. What was it like for you when you were at that huge transitional point of letting go of your old life and starting this new one? Well, you know how I was telling you about this cut and run thing. So that was super easy for me. 
by the end of my using, I didn't have any friends. Like nobody wanted to deal with me because you have party friends. And then the next level is you have friends you only do drugs with and you do not usually like them very much. And that's where I was at. And they call them, this is a terrible term, but lower companions. Well, my lower companions didn't want to hang out with me anymore. So it was very easy. I did not have to struggle. I'm like, great. Who wants to be my friend? Because <laughs> I don't have any of those other ones, but I've known a lot of people and I've sponsored a lot of girls who, what we say is like, they're not as low bottom as I was. You know, there were people who were functioning in the world and had jobs and it's really hard for them. I, in fact, think it's much harder. If someone like me, it was obvious my life wasn't working. I was unemployed and unemployable and all of those things. I think when you're a high functioning alcoholic or addict, it's much harder because you can look around your life and go, well, look, I've got these friends I've got, I'm making money, I'm doing all of these things. And you're far less willing to surrender to these pretty radical changes. But it's interesting too. It makes me think, and I think you talked about this on the Pat Flynn podcast that you were on, this idea, this big marketing idea of you are the sum total of the five people you surround yourself with. Is it five or eight or three? I can never remember. Six. (laughs) I think, I don't know, I'm sure it's more of a guideline than a science. But you know, it's something I think about. And I'd never heard about it until I got into marketing. And it's hard because you go, wait a minute, I've had this friend for a long time. What is it? Because that idea is very much people who are very successful will say that. And The people you surround yourself with, being successful is not my only priority. So I have people I surround myself who are maybe not as ambitious, but are super loving and spiritual. I have people who are really successful. And so that's something that I really, really think about. And where we met, that I love that. And I don't know how much we can talk about, you know, but it's basically this group that curates, they are specifically looking for people who are living their best lives. And it's like a sort of handpicked group of people that they gather. And I've met the most amazing people at those events, haven't you? Yeah, they've been amazing. It's a really deliberate selection. A lot of my guests have come from that group, actually. It's almost like a social mastermind. For listeners who don't know what a mastermind is, Napoleon Hill, the author of Think and Grow Rich, first talked about how powerful these groups are. And now they're pretty big in the business world. The goal is to brainstorm, to bring out the collective intelligence of a group. The idea being that when two people come together, they actually come to more powerful conclusions than if those same two people were to brainstorm by themselves. It's like intelligence multiplies instead of just adding together. But you can create these at home, even starting with just a few people. I'm part of one for podcasting. I'm part of a women's group that does something similar. And it's not about choosing only successful people. It's about who you want to be influenced by. Someone can be successful, but maybe they're a huge douchebag. Doesn't mean you want to be around them or you want to emulate them. Yes, absolutely. I think it can get confusing because when I first started to hear about that idea, I was like, well, I just need more successful friends, you know, and no, no, I never really understood this idea of a mentor or any of it, but I didn't really realize it's sort of like the teacher shows up when the student is ready. And I was sort of unmentorable because I sort of was so ruled by my ego. And now I have a mentor who's the one who introduced me to that group. I feel like networking is such a bad word for what is essentially just the excitement and thrill that comes from meeting people who are mentally aligned with you in terms of motivation. I find it to be the most exciting thing ever. I'm curious, what initially compelled you to share your story? And what did it do for you when you did? Well, it's interesting because that's my whole thing now. It was all very accidental. I wrote my first book, Party Girl. I got sober in LA where there's no shame in the game of being sober. Tons of cool, famous people are doing it. And I've always been really open about everything. I put this book out and it was the same year that people like Paris Hilton and Lindsay Lohan were making headlines for being these party girls. And so suddenly I was being asked to go on the Today Show and Fox News and the talk and insider talking about the quote party girl phenomenon. And again, I didn't think about it because there's no shame around it for me. And I didn't even understand that there were people who were ashamed of it. One of the first people going out there and talking about it. And people started coming to me, lots and lots and lots of people. 
The reason I decided to be open about it is that, as I said, getting sober was for me the beginning of life and not the end of life. And had I known what it was really like, I would have done it years before. I wouldn't have had to waste all those years. And I feel like it's my mission and my duty to go tell people, hey, guess what? It's not what you think it is. There's tons of cool, happy people. We are having so much fun. Of course, it's difficult. Life is difficult. It's not some Pollyanna nonsense, but it's not what you think it is. And so when I got sober, there was no one out there doing it. Now there's hundreds of sober blogs and there's tons of people out there teaching online courses on how to get sober. And it's become really crowded, this whole field. So I started a coaching program for writers and I've now published seven books, six of them traditionally. And one of them became a New York Times bestseller and most of them focus on addiction. So people started coming to me and saying, I want to write a book about addiction. So I started this coaching program and it's been amazing. I've done four cycles of it. I take 10 writers at a time. It's online videos. They get my friend, Kristen McGinnis, who's also a bestselling author of six books. She is their quote book architect and she walks them through it. And then we meet online and there's a private Facebook group. And the way that I started it, I went to my agent and I said, Hey, will you look at this as like a seeding process? Every group I will pick, I'm going to have them write book proposals and I will pick one person and I will give the proposal to you. And if you like the proposal, you can sign them. And if you don't like the proposal, you can give them advice. And she said, sure, I'd love it. And then I got a publisher to agree to do the same thing. And to my utter shock, one person from every group has sold a book, which was not expected. You know, they say three out of every 10,000 book proposals sell. And I'm wrapping up my fourth group now and the students are so good. I think we're going to have another sale. When I sign people out, it's application only. So I talk to each person on the phone. 90% of them say, I am really scared to do this. I don't want to put my story out there, but some voice inside of me is telling me I should do it. And inevitably, I watch each of them go through that thing where they put their story out there and they get freedom they could never have imagined. They think everybody's going to judge them. And instead, everybody comes forward and says, I'm so proud of you. And then that gives these new people permission to do the same. Because So I see it like domino. And it's the same thing with embracing the label of addict and sharing your story. By embracing the label, by telling your story, you are getting all those people that are struggling in shame. Me, when I was home alone in my cocaine addled brain in my apartment, all of those people get to hear about it and go, whoa, maybe there's hope for me too. So it, it is the most glorious thing because it not only gives you freedom, you the person sharing your story, but you have no idea how many other people you are giving freedom to who will then go and do the same thing. And I've watched in the 15 years I've been out there doing this, I, like I said, I've watched hundreds, if not thousands of people do this. So it's really, really rewarding. And I've heard you talk about this, like to realize you're doing something that's helping people. Because my work before when I was just writing books, it was really all about me. I'm like you. I felt so much freedom in sharing my story, even when I was younger. But I think part of me got a kick out of dropping the mic with something super outlandish and then watching people squirm. But I also realized at a young age that people will generally take things as you present them. So if you share a story confidently, people will usually adopt your perspective on it. If you're ashamed, they'll feel that too. On the flip side, though, I didn't share my story about my eating disorder for a really long time. And when I finally did, it was because I knew that I was finally confident that I was taking steps to get out of it, which then added an extra level of accountability. But before that, I think my biggest fear was that I was going to live with this for the rest of my life. And then people were going to watch me go to the bathroom after a meal forever. There's really nothing quite like the shame of somebody knowing you're bulimic and still being bulimic and not being able to stop your tendencies. Believe me, it happened with my mom for years. But I'm sure that's the same with drugs and alcohol. So accountability is huge. Right. It's such a good point, And there are several schools of thought on it. I remember when Intervention first started the show. And I remember I knew a producer on it. And she told me that that's their accountability. The fact that they've been on the show helps them to stay sober because they're walking through airports and they're seeing people and they know they're going to be held up as somebody who's doing it. So I think I looked at it subconsciously as insurance. The more people I tell, the more I've got to really do this. 
you don't know if doing it is going to be the thing that helps you commit to it. But also, I believe, and I think you're into this too, this idea of our intuition. If we've got that little voice that's saying, I can put my story out there, don't let fear stop you. The FEAR acronym is false evidence appearing real. If people think your attention getting F them, anybody who's going to think that is guarantee someone who is too afraid to go out there and get their own attention. Like I believe you owe it to the world to share your greatness and your light and your everything. And people, of course, they're going to have a problem with it. And thank God you're not living one of those small lives. Live the biggest life you can. You mentioned this big transition of getting sober and having all these little epiphanies of who you actually are now. How did you step out of the victim role to start to accept and love yourself for who you are now? It's a process. And it's interesting because that's what really that I've been dealing with these last few months with this EMDR stuff is I knew but didn't quote know how much the way my family treats me has defined me. And it just has reached ahead. Just they are for their different reasons, highly invested in keeping me small and unseen. And they have their different reasons. My family has always treated my career like it's a figment of my imagination. Oh, that's so cute. She thinks she wrote a book. Literally, that's how they talk about it. And I used to be on television twice a week. And I remember my dad saying to me once, my friends saw you on television. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, dad, I've been on twice a week for the last three years. And he just looked at me and part of it is narcissism of my doing things hammers home to them the fact that they're not doing those things. And I just didn't realize that, you know, I've been very, very, very lucky in terms of especially my timing. And I have this podcast that's about addiction and recovery. So I get emails not every day, every week that say your podcast saved my life. I never would have gotten sober if it hadn't been for it or this thing you wrote or your book. I think that I didn't understand I was doing this, but I would just go, oh, they have me confused with someone else. Oh, they don't understand I'm lucky. Oh, they don't get this. I'm not doing this. This is my career. And I didn't realize till I did this EMDR work that every compliment I was taking, I was turning it because that's what my family does to me. So I just think right now I'm finally in the process of embracing my greatness and self-love and that I had to undo a lot of shackles and I had to wait till I was 17 and a half years sober to even understand I was living under them. So now you must still experience triggers, even if they're not the same triggers as they were years ago. But what are some of your practices to step back and not be consumed by them anymore? Well, a phrase like pause when agitated, a phrase like restraint of pen, tongue and keyboard, kind of that thing I was talking about before, which is understand that I'm not rational when I'm triggered. I'm not. I'm in my animal brain. I'm in my fight or flight. Let's try not to make any radical decisions or actions because I will regret them. And, you know, I have been meditating for about 15 years usually 40 minutes a day. And that definitely can slow me down. They say in recovery, every year you get another second on that pause. So I have 18 seconds of pause now. And I screw it up all the time. I had a great thing happen the other day where I got a text that it triggered me. It had to do with work. And I immediately got on the phone and left a voice message defending myself, screwing myself over basically. And in a way I intrinsically done all the time because my ego reacts. And then I get a text that said, I couldn't hear your message at all. What did you say? And at that time I had the time to rethink it and I could come at it from a completely different perspective and see like, oh, I can screw myself over here by coming from my ego, or I can actually do what this person suggested I do. And both of our lives are going to be easier as a result. So I guess my answer is that I try to pause and I screw it up a lot. A lot of mind love guests have talked about their helpful journaling practices. So as a writer, I'm curious if you have any that are especially helpful. Well, I did it for a long time. In program, you do step work. So that's a lot of journaling is writing out your steps. And then I stopped. And then when this hard time kicked in in May, I decided to do morning pages. I'd never actually read The Artist's Way, but I had an accountability group on Facebook. And I said, let's do morning pages. And that's free writing for three pages a day, right when you wake up, no matter what. And I really broke through in the last couple of weeks and all my sadness lifted. One morning about two weeks ago, I woke up and I'm like, okay, I'm done with that. 
I'm not doing morning pages anymore. I couldn't tell you what I got out of it. I did write this, The Miracle Morning for Addiction Recovery with Joe Polish and Hal Elrod, and that came out a few months ago. And we talk a lot in there about these things you need to do every morning, and journaling is one of them. But I don't have a process beyond free writing, but there, everybody's got different recommendations. But I say get that detritus that's in your head, out of your head, and you're going to be a lot clearer that day. For listeners who are interested in learning more about you and your company and how to write their story, where can they find you? So Light Hustler exists to help people share their dark to find their light and light in terms of the spiritual light as well as lightheartedness because I'm a big fan of the funny. And so I have a storytelling show that's the fourth Friday of every month in Los Angeles and I get comedians who are sober to tell their most debaucherous, ridiculous stories and I tell stories too. And then, like I said, I have this writing program and I open it up twice a year. I don't know when this is posting, but I have spaces still left in my September group, which is launching mid-September. Anybody who is interested needs to reach out to me. But the first thing I recommend is people take this quiz. I have this quiz, which you can get at lighthustler.com slash quiz. And it's a should you be sharing your story quiz. So if you take the quiz, you will get an answer yes or no. I love it if people take the quiz and email me and say, yes, I got 100% or whatever. Anybody can email me. I answer all my emails and you can just reach me at Anna at AnnaDavid.com. If you want to know more about the actual writing program, which launches in September and then will launch again in May of 2019, it's at all the right moves.net. So it's A L L T H E W R I T E M O V E S dot net. Well, thank you so much for coming on and sharing so much of your story with us and all of your wisdom. It's been awesome. Oh my God, this was so much fun. I love knowing that I'm talking to like another smart, like minded lady out there. It was really, really fun. So thank you. Thank you for having me. Even if you aren't at all interested in writing a book about all the shit you've stepped in in this lifetime, I still have to stress the benefits of sharing your story. Whether you find a structured support group or a friendship circle, therapist, or you just start a journaling practice, when you take your internal loops and start unpacking them externally, it frees up space for new connections to be made. That void will be a vacuum, a magnet for those good things you're manifesting. All the links mentioned in this episode are at mindlove.com slash 043. If you like the show, the best way you can help is by leaving a review on iTunes or Google Podcasts. The more reviews and subscribes I have, the higher up I rank, and the more amazing guests want to be on the show. If you have any feedback or suggestions, feel free to send me an email on my contact form on my website at mindlove.com or reach out to me on my personal Instagram at mindlovemelissa. I actually love hearing from you guys there and it's where I get my most personal. So hope to see you all there. Thanks for giving your mind a little love today and I'll see you next week. Thanks for tuning into your higher frequency with Mind Love. Head to mindlove.com for a free gift to keep your vibes up until next week. Thank you.